This is the second of our Divine Council 101 series. And today we're addressing the question, are the plural Elohim of the Divine Council just men? Now, that might sound kind of odd to you, but believe me, it's one of the things that you will see and run into most often when you're trying to study passages like Psalm 82, or as we'll see when Jesus quotes Psalm 82 in John chapter 10. Now, Psalm 89, if you recall our first lesson, answers this question because if you recall that verse, we have a reference to the divine council being in the skies, in the heavenlies, in the heavens as it were. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. And that phrasing is going to become important in our lesson today, the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings, and that is the B'nai Elim, the sons of God, as we saw last time, who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord, a God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones, and awesome above all those who are around him. So in Psalm 82, we had gods. I said you are gods, Psalm 82, verse 6. Sons of the Most High, all of you. And these were the gods in Psalm 82, verse 1, where we have Elohim, Nitzav Ba'adat El. God takes his stand or takes his place in the divine council. And then Bekerev Elohim, in the midst of the Elohim, in the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. And those are the gods that are called sons of the Most High, five verses later. And here in Psalm 89, we have the assembly, the council of the holy ones, the council of the sons of God in the skies. So you might ask, well, how in the world could anybody even entertain the question that the gods, the Elohim, the plural Elohim of Psalm 82 are just men? Well, that's what we want to talk about today. The idea actually comes from a couple of places. One would be Exodus 18. Now, this is the passage, if you recall, where... Moses is judging the people, and this is after the Exodus. They're on their way. They're, they're about to, ready to get the law at Sinai. And Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, comes out and sees basically how Moses is spending his days, all of the people lining up, coming to him for questions. And he says, look, this isn't a good idea. Why don't you appoint judges, appoint people to help you out here? And we get that story. We get the record of what Moses does in Exodus 18. And believe it or not, people take this passage and say, look, these judges that Moses appointed are the Elohim of Psalm 82. And you think, well, again, how in the world could you get there? Well, part of the answer is you get there because you need to get there because there are lots of people who want to deny divine plurality in Psalm 82. But if we actually go look at Exodus 18, we go to the passage, and what I've done on your screen is I've used something called a visual filter in my software, Logos Bible software. And I'll show you the filter. What it does is I've set it to colorize every occurrence of the word Elohim. Now I'm going to start scrolling through Exodus 18, and wherever you see the word God or God's colorized, that's going to be the word Elohim. Now, you'll notice that we have one plural instance of Elohim translated gods in the ESV. And that's a reference to the pagan gods, the gods of the nations that the Israelites were not supposed to worship. So obviously those gods weren't appointed to be judges of, of Israel. But you'll notice something. Everywhere else in Exodus 18 that you see the word Elohim, two things. One, it could very easily just be translated God a reference to the God of Israel. And the word is never linked to the judges. It's never actually linked to the people who are helping Moses render judgment. So this idea that Exodus 18, the appointing of judges, somehow uh, allows us to call the Elohim of Psalm 82 men, again, just really doesn't work when you actually go look at the passage. There's no reason to read Exodus 18 that way at all. Now, that isn't the only sort of attempted proof for the idea that the Elohim of Psalm 82 are just men. 
We could go to Exodus 22, verses 8 and 9, and there's something interesting going on there, sort of underneath the hood of your English translation. Let's take a look at the passage. This is the account where there's a judicial setting, a judicial case. Uh, It's about thievery against some laws and punishments, that kind of idea. And we read here, starting in verse 8, If the thief is not found, the owner of the house shall come near to God to show whether or not he has put his hand to his neighbor's property. For every breach of trust, whether it is for an ox, for a donkey, for a sheep, for a cloak, or for any kind of lost thing of which one says, this is it, the case of both parties shall come before God. The one whom God condemns shall pay double to his neighbor. Now, there are those who would say, look, it doesn't make any sense, you know, to, to bring these little judicial cases before God. Surely, you know, God there must be translated, you know, plural, Elohim. Bring, bring him before the gods, meaning the Israelite judges. Of course, the passage never actually says that. You have to read that into the passage. But as the ESV points out, it's very easy just to have capital G-O-D here anyway, because the idea might be, okay, bring the thief near to you know, sacred space or the place of the sanctuary, again, sort of holy ground where God, you know, lives. Because you see this happen in other places in the Torah, in the Pentateuch, where people are brought by Moses or Joshua or whoever, and they all gather together like at the entrance of the tabernacle. And it it actually says, Lifnei Adonai, you know, before the Lord or before God. So that could be quite easily what's going on here. We don't have to read into the passage the idea that, We have judges here, and the judges are Elohim, and there we go. We can take that to Psalm 82. Now, there's something going on in in this passage under the hood, as I mentioned a few moments ago. A couple of things to look at more closely. If we look at the word God in the passage, we can see, obviously, that that is indeed Elohim. If we look at the verb right next to it, condemns, there's something here that Again, for those who want to argue a plural translation here, that sort of drives them to do so, or at least gives them a good excuse. And that is the word condemns is morphologically plural. The little abbreviation here in my reverse center linear uh, tells us that this is a verb form and it's third masculine plural. The P is for plural. And so they would say, well, look, we have to translate Elohim here, gods, because subject verb agreement. Okay, the noun is morphologically plural. Everybody knows that about Elohim. Most of the time it's used with a singular verb form, like in Psalm 82, the first occurrence. But here we have a plural, so we must translate it with a plural. So here, this, the translation should say, the one whom the gods condemn shall pay double to his neighbor. And therefore, we, we have to have Israelite judges. We can't have any other thing. Well, That's not actually a secure argument. It's not nearly as secure as the people who make it would like you to think. Because it assumes that plural verb forms with Elohim require a plural translation of Elohim. Now, I actually wrote on this subject, and you should be looking at that on your screen right now, Uh, Should Elohim with plural predication be translated gods? I wrote this for a journal called the Bible Translator in 2010. And in this article, I search for, I use some some special databases, again, that Logos pioneered. Uh, Syntactic databases, we pioneered the development. It was developed by two scholars, uh, Francis Anderson and Dean Forbes. And that allows us to search for this kind of thing where we have a noun, but I want to know what the predicator of that noun is, and then you can apply morphology to it. So that's what I did. I found all the the occurrences where Elohim, or Ha-Elohim, Elohim Elohim with a definite article, goes with, in the sentence, in a clause, a plural verb form, a plural predicator, whether, whether it be a finite verb or a participle. Because I wanted to see, okay, in, in these instances, do we have to translate it? Does it make any sense to translate it as a plural, gods? Just kind of a subject I was interested in. Now, there are 10 of these. There are 10 occurrences where you have Elohim or Ha Elohim with plural predication. Uh, you can see the list in front of you. Our passage, of course, is Exodus 22, 8. Now, if a few of these, we can sort of just wipe off the table right off the bat because they're in the mouths of pagans or the mouths of Gentiles 
or the mouths of apostates. The references in 1 Kings, of course, coming from the mouth of Jeroboam and Jezebel. Again, we don't really care what they say about Elohim because they could be, you know, hit or miss theologically. What we care about more is sort of an, what an Orthodox Israelite, a biblical writer, uh, would do in the text, would do with the grammar. So do, do the biblical writers require us through their use of grammar in these instances, okay, these you know, less than 10 now instances of Elohim with plural predication? Should we see that as a plural? Should we see Elohim as a plural and translate it accordingly in these passages? So these are the, the passages we want to focus on, or at least I'm just going to make a, make a few comments about them and then go back to Exodus 22. Now, my findings in the article, and again, some of you may or may not have access to this article. Uh, journal articles are often not publicly accessible. If you're part of my Divine Council bibliography, you will have access to this article because it's part of the collection. But in any event, every instance, okay, every instance, this is sort of my conclusion in the article, Every instance of Elohim or Ha Elohim plus plural predication, except for possibly, it's a maybe, Genesis 35, 7, shows that Elohim could not only be translated singularly, God, capital G-O-D, but actually should be because of something else in the context, something else going on in the grammar. Now, I want to take you to a few examples here where the grammatical context requires a singular translation, capital G-O-D, even though Elohim is lumped in, you know, grouped with a plural predicator. 2 Samuel 7.23 is a really good example. Let's take a look at the passage. We read in verse 23, And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem to be his people, making himself a name and doing for them great and awesome things by driving out before your people, so on and so forth, you know, driving out the nations. Now, I have the verb went highlighted here. Its subject is God, Elohim. And the verb here is plural. Our little morphological codes show us that it's plural. And so should we translate this, and who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth whom the gods went to redeem? No, wait a minute to be his people. You can see right away a plural translation doesn't make any contextual or theological sense, but there's actually a grammatical point to be made here. If you look carefully at the verse, we have whom, you know, one nation on earth, whom God went, whom Elohim went, there's our plural verb, Elohim went to redeem to be his people. We have a singular suffix, his people. That alone tells us, aside from the contextual incongruity of a plural translation here, that tells us that even though we have Elohim plus a plural verb form, we really have to translate this as singular G-O-D because we have a singular suffix here. Not only one, but we actually have a second one. To redeem to be his people was our first one, making himself a name. Again, the same thing, a singular suffix, preposition plus suffix. So we have two indications that only one entity, okay, only one entity is being referred to as the one who went to redeem his people. And even though the verb form is plural and Elohim is plural, it still requires a singular translation because of the rest of the grammar. Now, this is what you would take back to Exodus 22. What the point is, is that there is no reason, grammatically, theologically, contextually, there is no reason to conclude, if you're just looking at Exodus 22.8, that Elohim there should be translated plural and that it points to human judges. It's just fine to translate it singularly. Just God, capital G-O-D. Translation of capital G-O-D works just fine. So Exodus 22.8 is no argument for, again, this idea that we have plural Elohim here and they must just be men. They must just be Israelite judges. It doesn't work. Now, next time, we're going to talk more about this. Again, this is part of a whole series on the Divine Council. Next time, we're going to talk about this question. Are the gods, the plural Elohim of the Divine Council, just idols? 
You say, well, if they're not men, I, I still don't want to admit that we have plural Elohim running around the spiritual world. That still freaks me out. What about monotheism? Again, we'll get to the monotheism question. It's not something that you need to be disturbed about, even though it's a very common question. But some people will say, okay, they can't be men, they must just be idols. After all, all those references to gods in the Old Testament, they're just talking about idols. They're not real. That also is wrong, and we'll see that next time.